Welcome on in golf fans, it's your boy GS Luke and we've got the second major of the year, the PGA Championship and we've got our core plays video where we'll be breaking down the top end of the DraftKings pricing and four foundational plays that I'll be getting a ton of leverage to in my GPP lineups. These four players are going to have the kind of upside that you're looking for to potentially take home one of those 50 to 100,000 entry sort of contests and hopefully bring home the bucks for everyone in the community. So looking forward to it, going to break down those top four plays, but also a few of the key metrics that I'm using to identify some of my top plays and go through my player pool for the week um, and try and find some of the best course fits for Oak Hill Country Club, which if you haven't heard, has been around for a while, but it's going to have a little bit of a different look here in 2023, a whole restoration done, taking it back to the golden age design, golden age contours. Uh, so it should be extremely difficult here. So if you haven't seen that, check out my course breakdown. I go through all of the changes extensively but here gonna more so focus on the DFS side of things and how I'm attacking the top end of the board so without further ado let's go ahead and get this thing started with our key stats of the week we've got a big boy golf course this is going to be extremely difficult this time at Oak Hill it's much longer than the last time we saw it in 2013 and just to remind you in 2003 when they played the PGA championship year the cut was plus nine and it wasn't like it was super windy it's just that kind of golf of course. So you're looking at a course that's even more difficult than then. Now I'm not expecting a nine over par scoring average. These guys hit the ball a much longer distance at this point, uh, but you're going to have to be one of those big time ball strikers to really have any chance at winning here. You've heard a few players say it'd be nice to carry at 320 plus. Of course, you know, only talking about like four or five players at that point, but if you're not at least in that top 10, maybe 15% when it comes to driving distance, I really think you're going to struggle out there this week. So that's something that's going to be in everyone's model. You can see for me, it's actually only at number three because it's much more than that, right? This isn't just a long course with long rough like you see at a U.S. Open every single year. This is also an architectural masterpiece. And by that, it's going to test not just your off the tee play but all four parts of your game the greens are difficult here they have a lot of subtle undulation to them they're going to be running extremely fast here for a pga championship but furthermore you have extremely difficult around the green shots because of some of the bunkering that's been redone since 2019 um andrew green came in completely restored the oak hill east course um and made it just like donald ross designed which are steep faced bunkers, deep bunkers around the green. And even when you're not in one of those hazards, you're going to be in a chipping hollow out of some gnarly rough, which uh, makes for some of the more difficult around the green shots that these players are going to be facing all year. So whether it's missing the greens, whether it's trying to save yourself when you inevitably do miss the greens um, around an Oak Hill, um, whether it's the putting, which the greens are going to be extremely difficult this time around, you're going to have to have a complete game, and obviously the distance, I would say, would be the extra factor on top, but don't make that the only thing you're looking at. I think what's important from the distance perspective is if you're looking for a top five, top ten, or winner, there's probably only a small subset of players that are even capable of getting to that performance, right? It's kind of like there's a height limit to get on the roller coaster, right? If you can hit it this sort of distance, you have the capability to go out there and finish in the top five, top ten but that doesn't guarantee success, right? You've got to be able to go out there, execute from fairway in at that point, um, and that's where you're going to find your separation towards the top of the board. So my model <clears throat> is going to follow a lot of that. Of course, over here, my weighting is blacked out. Um, it's over there on the Patreon version, of course, for you guys to see. Uh, but you can see around the greens up there, we're looking at shots gained at difficult scoring conditions. Um, around the green and courses with deep rough, almost all the greens are surrounded by really lush rough. Um, here at Oak Hill, bogey avoidance, three putt avoidance because of how fast and slopey some of these greens are. And if you're looking for comp courses, Pinehurst, extremely difficult around the green, um, has no rough to be had. So a little bit of a different test, but um, still the same kind of skill set plays there. Um, looking at East Lake, Aronimink, we're looking at the Country Club and Winged Foot Golf Club. Um, all difficult ball striking tests, all up here in the Northeast. Um, and I should say, except for East Lake, right? That, that's down there in Atlanta. But Donald Ross designs for these top three. The Country Club also similar from the agronomy perspective. Um, it all similar, extremely difficult ball striking tests uh, that I think you can use for a comp. So with that being said, right, just to summarize, 
We're looking for long players to have a complete game. Well, doesn't that sound like John Rahm, right? The world's best driver um, in the best form of anybody in this field. Oh, and somebody that tends to love bent grass as well. So you can look at event history, right? It's not going to be for this golf course. Um, he's been pretty decent at PGA Championships. And in general, when you put John Rahm in difficult conditions, he tends to thrive. Just think of the memorial when he went out there was stomping the field until he got COVID there on Sunday. Um, a few of his victories over the last few months right, have been at difficult golf courses. Right? The Masters victory. I would definitely check that box off. Um, John Rahm, $11,400. This is about as perfect a fit as you could possibly get, right? The putter fit is there. Uh, I know it's worse than his last 36 rounds, but he has been one of, if not the best putter in the world over that stretch. Uh, so it's kind of hard to compare to this 0.9 shot baseline, but still loves that bent grass. You take a look at the made cut percentage, it's nearly 97%. So like, you're talking about a player with essentially the highest floor in the entire slate. You take a look at the recent form, right? Played there at Mexico, finished in second to Tony Finau. Um, that's solid. I had the win at the Masters, T15 at Heritage, a course that didn't really even fit his game. Uh, just all things pointing upwards for John Rahm. The only real issue for GPPs is that he's going to get ownership. He's also $11,400, but because of how many names are down there in the 7K range, you can still build lineups, even starting with the John Rahm, adding in another piece here in the 9K range or even the top end of the 8K um, and still building a really competitive lineup. So the soft pricing makes that price tag a little bit negligible too. So for me, given the course fit, given the fact that he's a much better putter on bent grass um, than everybody up top, literally everyone, you know, from $8,000 and above, he's your best putter on the surface. Uh, the off the tee play speaks for itself, right? He's probably the best player in the world in that department, especially when he's firing in all cylinders. I um, mean, the putter's been a lot more consistent than a Scotty Scheffler and a Roy McIlroy. Last week, Scotty kept missing those four to seven footers. So frustrating for all of us to watch, of course. Um, Roy McIlroy went out there, has not been consistent with the putter for quite some time. In fact, is a loser over his last 36 rounds. Um, but then you have John Rahm, who's doing pretty much all the same things from tee to green, right? But has had that flat stick. And with a course where you have to have that well round game. Um, that's kind of what I'm looking for. So a lot of it's going to come down to ownership. Hopefully Rom's not by and far the highest owned player up top. I do think that the price tag might keep his ownership a little bit lower um, towards the range where we want it to be. Um, hopefully in that like 15 at most like 20% range is what we're hoping for here. But either way, love the course fit. I'll be on John Rom. Already bet him outright for this golf tournament. Uh, just feels like inevitable that he's going to go out there and win the second major too. I know it hasn't happened happened for quite some time, but he's that dominant of a player where he can shake that off, go out there, um, deal with the pressure of it. And, uh, you know, if there's anyone else, I might be a little bit hesitant to do so, but I truly do think that John Rahm is the best player in the world. Uh, I think that he's on another level, even compared to like a Scotty Scheffler in terms of um, pure talent level, in terms of pure pedigree long term. And uh, this sort of golf tournament would do would go, would go a really long way to proving that correct. So uh, I'm going to be there in John Rahm. I've been a believer in him long term, particularly at difficult ball striking tests. And uh, I like the consistency with the putter of late. That's really what separates him from all these other players, right? That's why he's been on the stretch of golf that he is. Um, and at a major championship, that's something that I'm going to look to ride, even at higher ownership levels. Next up, we've got Patrick Cantlay. And I don't like Patrick Cantlay, right? I've been very vocal about, you know, his slow play. I give him a hard time here. I fade him all the time. Uh, we've had the cheeks clenched the last, like, two months here, fading him pretty much every single slate. And it's worked out for the most part. Um, at, let's say the third place at the Heritage, right, was a marginal fade. Uh, he definitely wasn't in the optimal lineup, but third place finish was pretty good if you had him in a single entry kind of build. Um, but I, now I'm jumping on board because we're getting him off of Bermuda grass. And my main reasoning for the fade almost week in and week out with Cantlay um, was that we had him on Bermuda grass. There's a reason why he's avoided it, right? There's a reason why he doesn't have a ton of course history at tracks with Bermuda grass. Well, now we're on bent grass. We've got Kentucky. Kentucky bluegrass around the green. And if you take him off of Bermuda, he is at least a top five around the green player, at least a top five short game player, if not top three or even the best week to week on the PGA Tour. And if you take a look at the ball striking stats, now this is where you start to get excited, particularly off the tee, where he is 
been the best player in the field over that stretch and that's not an exaggeration he's been that good the more and more you zoom in on him actually the better it gets he's now gaining 1.2 strokes per round he's not only driving it a long way you know just like a scotty scheffler rom and rory mcavoy he's hitting a lot more fairways than those three players and at this kind of course that has that off the tee emphasis you know he's a really good around the green player and putter the iron play has been electric over that stretch too right gaining half a stroke per round over the last 12 over the last 36 he's getting 0.4 strokes per round with the approach play just the sky is the limit for Patrick Cantley. I just I can't speak enough about how much I think this course fit fits him how much you know I normally talk crap about his game you know this is the one time I don't think I can right he fits the course we got you know all the excuses out of the way when it comes to the Bermuda grass around the green and he's cheaper than he should be $9,700 is way too cheap now because of Jordan Spieth might not even play, right? He might withdraw from this event. Um, I think that Brooks is probably a little too expensive. Same thing with Colin Morikawa. Cantlay is going to be unbelievably popular. I mean, he should be, right? He should be probably at least 20, maybe even 25% out. Um, if that's the case, if he ends up being the highest owned player on the slate, we might have to rethink this come Wednesday. But if he's moderately owned, let's say he's in like the 18 to even the 22% owned range, um, then I'm going to be all on Patrick Cantlay, right? As long as he's not just some egregious chalk here in the 9K range, uh, I think I'm comfortable to use him in a solid amount of my GPP lineups. If he ends up being really popular, maybe I do avoid him when it comes to these kind of contests. But I do play him in cash, right? I go try and use him in that kind of format. Um, still keep the outright bet that I've already placed on him. You know, I'm not going to cash it out because he's popular in DFS. You know, I'll use him in those other kind of markets, right? Where I already have investment. Um, take him in the markets where you don't have to worry about the game theory approach. Um, but until we see some crazy ownership number on Patrick Cantlay, I'm going to, you know, operate under the assumption that we'll be able to use him in some of these contests. As a quick reminder, guys, if you're looking for access to all of those key stat weightings, all my modeling projections, ownership, player poll as the week goes on, make sure to check out my Patreon page. The link is down in the description of the video as per usual. But what I want to focus on here is the book that I have coming out on pre-sale this week. You may have seen me talk about it over there on Twitter, some of my social media, or even on my Patreon page. But I've been working on a book covering some of my modeling process, how you can take it, adapt it to some of the sports that you might be playing on the side, or even make some of your own golf models yourself. Um, and go out there and hopefully kind of teach you guys how to fish. I've been working on creating this tutorial for at least three years. And uh, as you can see, it has come to fruition. So uh, on Thursday this week uh, is going to be the pre-sale of the book. Anyone that's on my social media, that's a Patreon, that follows me here on YouTube, uh, will have access to go out there and only buy it for a dollar. So if you want the access to that, you want to hear all the updates in terms of the book, uh, make sure to follow me on social media. I'll be on my Twitter. I'll be posting it on my Patreon there as well um, for the discounted rate. Uh, and yeah, I'm really excited, really stoked to be able to share with you guys. And uh, the book is called Decide to Win, as you can see. And it's a short-haired me on there as well. Uh, a rare sight, especially with the uh, long flowing dreads that we've got at this point. But, uh, but like I said, make sure to check out the social medias if you haven't seen them already and check out the Patreon if you're looking for all the modeling, all the analysis that I'm doing, including all the prop stuff that I'm posting on that end. But without further ado, let's go ahead and get back to the scheduled programming. Next up, we've got Justin Thomas, $9,400. And if you're looking for a complete player, particularly around the green, well, you're looking for a Justin Thomas, right? He's got the around the green play. He's last year's champion at Southern Hills, another course that really emphasized all four shots gained categories. And of late, look at the last 12 measured rounds. He's getting back to that baseline we're looking for, right? Gaining across all three tee to green categories. The off the tee plays have gotten a lot more consistent. He has gains of four, three and a half strokes off the tee on um, his last two major events. You can see gaining close to a stroke per round with the approach play. Um, that was a huge red flag for him for quite some time. In fact, if you look at the last 36 rounds, you can see it's you know it's only half a stroke per round. Like he's he's used to gaining like a stroke per round in the category. Is maybe the best iron player in all the PGA Tour when he's playing well. And over 
over the last month or so, it looks like he's found something. It looks like the ball striking is getting back to his um, bread and butter, what you're used to seeing literally year in and year out from a Justin Thomas. And then the around the green play, he's been number one on the PGA Tour this year. In fact, actually, I think he slipped down to number two behind Matt Kuchar when it comes to a lot of the around the green stats, but still number two on the PGA Tour in that department. And the putter has become a lot more consistent here, which is what's so frustrating about his season. He's had the putter some weeks, and usually when he's has the putter, you know, the ball striking is the problem, and he's had the ball striking a lot of late and no putter. If he can marry the two together, go out there and win this event just like he did last year in 2022. So um, JT, $9,400, another player that I have an outright bet in, and another guy that I think is going to be popular, except the saving grace here is that you have a Cam Young, Victor Hovland, and Sanjay that I know are gonna, all going to get a bunch of ownership um, and probably take at least a little bit away from Justin Thomas at $9,400. So I still think he'll get some attention, but unlike Patrick Cantlay, I can't see him getting to the 20% plus owned range. So um, you can feel pretty safe about taking JT in some lineups. Um, given the course fit, given how he's played over the last month, I think he's a high upside play to keep an eye out for um, this time around. And our last player we're going to be talking about here is Dustin Johnson at $8,800. And DJ, Liv Tour, right, won last week over there at Tulsa. Um, a lot of people last time wanted to write off a lot of these Liv guys um, and not use them at the Masters. And then you had three of them finish in the top five, right? I mean, completely throw that theory out the window. Clearly, they're still um, in contention to not only compete at these majors, but go out there and win one of these major championships. And DJ, even before the win at Tulsa, was on my radar. He loves these Northeastern golf courses. He's long off the tee like we're looking for. He's really a well-rounded player, right? He gains across all four stat categories, and he's only $8,800 really cheap, right? Affordable. You can use them as your third man in perhaps for even some of the more balanced lineups. And I think at, with the bentgrass putting numbers we've seen, the ownership, though it's going to be a little bit higher than it would have been if he didn't win at Tulsa, I don't think he's going to be mega chalky, right? There's going to be a subset of the field, and we looked at this after the Masters, that just don't play the live guys. Guys like Cam Smith, DJ, Gooch, Mito Pereira, right? Guys that would probably be pretty chalky if they were still on the PGA Tour. We're all about half, sometimes even a third the ownership that they should have been. We looked at that on our weekend review stream after the Masters, and though I think that the top, you know, the three guys that finished in the top five at the Masters um, are going to change a lot of people's perceptions on Liv, right? Might make them a little bit more likely to play these kind of guys this time around. There's still going to be at least half the guys that faded them all last time that just refused to play the Liv guys out of spite for the tour. So, um, from the game theory perspective, for us playing in the GPP poll, right, trying to um, take that game theory approach, that's perfect, right? That's just adding value to these sort of players. Um, given his form, kills these northeastern courses, loves bent grass, right? There's no recent form to look at, but event history, we can look at for DJ. He loves the PGA Championship, right? Missed the cut the last two times, but second, second, 27th, um, shows up almost every single time here at these kind of events. Last two years have been like the outlier for him. Uh, I look for him to bounce back in terms of that course history. Uh, if you looked at the shots gained, right, they're super misleading. They're over like the last year, but like, like I said, gaining essentially across the board. So um, I like DJ this week. I hope that he's coming in at, let's say like 10 to 15% ownership. Um, and if so, I will be well over the field. Alrighty, guys, that is all I've got for this week's core plays. Before you hop on out of here, first off, go ahead, smash that like button, but also go ahead and comment down below who you're taking as your winner. The only rule here, they can't be in the 11K range. So no Scotty, no John Rahm. Uh, you still can take Roy right there at 10-7, but go ahead and let me know who you've got taking this whole thing down. I'm going to be a little bit more creative than most about it. I'm going back to back. JT, PGA Championship at Southern Hills. I think he's going to take, get it done this time around um, over here at Oak Hill. But go ahead, let me know your thoughts down in the comments and give me a little nugget why, right? Let me know why you're taking that player. Um, I would love to hear what you guys are cooking up for this week. Until next time, best of luck with those lineups. Any outright bets you decide to go with, I did bet all four of these core plays outright um, early this morning here on Monday. So hopefully the numbers you know, go down in value. I'm expecting all of them too. I especially think that DJ, as he gets a little bit more attention throughout the week, um, his numbers 
is probably going to go down and down and down. So probably hop on those as quick as humanly possible so you don't see a ton of action there. Uh, but we'll be back with a value plays video. We'll have fades and sleepers, our weekly live stream Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern time. So make sure to check that out to, you know, get all the last second content, get any questions in that you have. We're going through the weather. We'll go through some chalk on there, some prop content too. Uh, everything you need to get ready to go out there and cash out and have a good week at the PGA. Uh, so stoked for it. Excited to see who's going to be this year's champion. And I'll catch you guys for the content throughout the week. Mm -hmm.